we ever heard was Lebanese are terrorists, Lebanon are kidnappers, Lebanon is war, Lebanon are... Uh, someone of Lebanese background, mm. you felt this way. Can you imagine like what other people had um, felt about Lebanon and the Lebanese people? And Daisy, welcome to Brains Plot. Thank We've you. We've been looking forward for this conversation for months. And it's so exciting to finally have you here. Uh, before we proceed with our conversation, I want to go back to the time when you felt ashamed of being called Lebanese. Mm. What experiences and perceptions shaped that feeling? And to be honest with you, what changed your mind to get involved in the Middle Eastern problems? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Roland. Thank you for reaching out while I was in Lebanon. And it's... um. Uh, you know, an honor and a privilege to be sitting and talking about my favorite topic, Lebanon, and <laughs> having somebody here that's as passionate as I am about Lebanon, always very exciting. I love that, uh, you know, that point that you raised, uh, because it's going to shock a few people that I was ashamed, but growing up in Australia in the 70s and 80s, the only thing I ever saw about Lebanon was what came out in the media, the, the television, the newspapers, the radio, and everything we ever heard was Lebanese are terrorists, Lebanon are kidnappers, Lebanon is war, Lebanon are backward, yani, nothing positive ever was expressed publicly about Lebanon. So in a way, I went in because at home I loved my culture. I love my family. I love my relatives. We lived a completely Lebanese life at home. So it didn't gel, but I didn't actually realize that Lebanese is also what I was brought up in the home until I got a little bit older. But in my youth, Lebanon and Lebanese meant something very disrespectful and bad. So I was ashamed. I grew up at school not wanting to say I was Lebanese, feeling uncomfortable to say I was Lebanese. And then it took, um, you know, and a, a trip to Lebanon when I was 23. I went back to Lebanon, forced by my beautiful God rest her soul mother, who said, go visit your relatives. You're going to Europe. You're going to Asia. Rohi ala Lebanon, go visit your relatives. I said, mom, there's a war. There's a war. Why would I want to go there? She said, the uh, airport's open. She didn't say that. She's actually, my mom, God bless her, was a, a pioneer. She didn't get married till she was 31. So back in the day. Well, so, <laughs> yeah. um, yani, on a jawas, but it's not the most important thing at a young age. So I went to Lebanon on my way back from Europe. And, um, you know, flying across the Mediterranean, I'd just been to the French Riviera looking at this beautiful coastline and we're flying and I saw this amazing coastline and I said to the person next to me, what's that country? And they said, that's Lebanon. And I was like, oh, my God, it was so beautiful. Yani balla, yani, I don't know. The change happened, started then. Was it turning point from your It point? Started, it started and then flying over the airport and Sabran Shatila and the destruction, I wasn't worried about it. But then that trip that was supposed to be two weeks ended up being six weeks. The war was raging and I was so fascinated, not scared, curious. I had family who was in the aware family, in the army family, in the, you know, in so they would take me, the, they'd take me to the green line. So I got to go on the green line and snipers and wake up and down and the juar that are like one building size deep and long. I became fascinated. I want to know why Lebanon was in this turmoil. And Baramna Lebanon, my dad is from Riyadh, so we went to the Bekaa. My mum is from the Shmer, so we went up to Kusba. And I got to move around and I became fascinated and curious as to why Lebanon was in this predicament when it was such a beautiful country. The history, the Baalbek, I went to the ruins, you know, like I said, I love history. I was going, oh my God, this coastline, Biblos, what the hell? Why, why is this happening to this amazing country? And it's all so small. So that was the, nucleus of the change that happened inside me. I went back to Australia and I was working at the Australian newspaper at the time as the first soccer writer, female soccer writer at uh, News Limited and in Australia. And I said to my editor-in-chief, I said, 
I need to move to the foreign desk. I need to understand what the hell's going on in the Middle East, in Lebanon. Why is there such a crisis for so many decades in the Middle East? And they were very generous and helped, moved me to the foreign desk. And that was 1988. And since then, I've been drowning in Lebanon and the Middle East and um, very, very personally committed to the I want cause. To go back to, I want to stay in the 1998. Or, was it 98 or 88? 88. 88. So yeah. let's go. So if we go back to 84, 88, mm. is it the time where you really not hated Lebanon, but you were ashamed of being Lebanese? Yes. You, as a someone of Lebanese background, mm. you felt this way. Can you imagine like what other people had um, felt about Lebanon and the Lebanese people in Australia yeah. and globally? Mm. What, what was the feeling, do you think? Well, so there's there's a difference, though. Because they're looking at a country that's being racked with war and strife. And if you're an adult, you understand, you have more understanding. I didn't have much understanding as a child. Um, you feel sorry. But then you also have the people say, you're all kidnappers, you're all murderers, you're all warmongers. So you have this split depending on the knowledge of the people, or how much knowledge they have. But you're right. You mean Australian people? Australians and foreigners who don't know Lebanon, but they know Lebanese people because they meet the Lebanese people here. And Lebanese in Australia have had such an amazing, um, made a contribution to Australia since the 1880s. You know, the, the first, 1889, I think, was the first Lebanese to arrive in Australia and have had a tremendous, you know, impact on Australia and have amazing Lebanese um, identities, you know, Sir Nicholas Shahidi, Mari Bashir, and very many others who have reached very, sig you know, significant um, levels in general life, you know, in broad public life in Australia. So, you know, it was, it's not just because of the war they hated, they thought Lebanese were all bad. But for me, as a child, I didn't know our background. I didn't know our history. I just knew my family. So was it the behavior of the Lebanese people in Australia that gave you this perception? Or, no, or what was it really? The media, the, the media, media, the headlines calling us, you know, kidnappers, terrorists, all of this. The media. Framing you in. The framing box, the yeah. Lebanese as this. Like, you know, I was embarrassed, you know. Lebanese terrorists, Lebanese kidnappers taking all these people. Like, you know, it was like. Oh, God, you know, mm. that's not who I am. I can't identify with that kind of person. That's not the people I live with. They're not the people I know, Lebanese I know. Mabish mm. Bahorn, you know. So I was distancing myself from Lebanon over there, not Lebanon in Australia, mm. you know, and then going to see what Lebanon in Lebanon, the Lebanese in Lebanon, I instantly connected with these people. It's like, you know, I love Australia, but, and I'm very Australian, but it was a connection like I didn't even, it was spiritual, mm. chemical. I don't know what it was, but it was like, I get these people. I love their sense of humor. I love their fight, their resilience, their, their, um, you know, passion. Mahdumin, yani. They were like, I'll tell you a great story. We're in, um, the Badaro, yeah. Badaro. <laughs> It's no, no, my cousin is a, she's an optometrist and she was taking me from her office to go shopping. We're going to Badaro. Badaro is the only shared, a beautiful shared. It's like, yeah, you know, it's a street in Beirut. Very posh area. Very posh area. And they had sandbags, you know, in front of the, in front of all the shops to mm. stop the windows being, um, you know, Smart. shattered. Yeah, shattered. And so we're walking down this nice street and, and very chic and, you know, high heels and whatever. And then they start bombing at the end of the street. So, yalla, yalla, behind the, the sandbags. Okay, wait, two minutes, stops. Yalla, okay, keep going. <laughs> like, wow, so life will always go. Yeah. But, you know, it's like I'm looking at yalla, and it's like this was it. We deal with it one minute and it's, you know, it's over. It was a fascinating reaction. Wow, cool. Like, you know, it was this, <sighs> this is a character. These are characteristics that, of course, Australians don't have because they're not living in war or whatever. You're not having to. Yeah, they're not exposed. They're not exposed to that. 
But I was like, wow, what a determination, how resourceful, how so many experiences, so many little stories like that that rewrote my narrative about Lebanon compared to what I grew up learning from the media. My brain got rewritten. I saw something completely different to what they told me, they taught me. So going there was the best thing for me to understand the truth. That's good. Uh, at least you made this transition. But if if I can ask you this question, like 40 years down the track, between 84 till now, 2024, yeah. what did really change? In Lebanon? Perception-wise, about Lebanese oh, it's been globally big. And, it's and in Australia specifically. It really has been big, honestly. As someone of the member of the media, there's been a huge shift uh, globally. Look, Lebanon's um, image in that time period was, you know, very clear. And then you we moved from the end of the war, the period of Hariri and the redevelopment and the uh, regrowth of and renaissance of Lebanon. Yeah, Hariri is the ex-prime minister. Ex -prime, of, yes, right. The first post-war prime minister. Assassinated, yeah. In 2005, yeah. So Rafi Hariri ushered in a new era for Lebanon and the redevelopment of Beirut, you have to remember that a lot of countries, um, their diplomacy with Lebanon, France, Britain, um, you know, even America, there's a lot of sympathy and appreciation for Lebanon. Greece, where, where, do, where are the Lebanese? There's a diplomacy between the nations that they see Lebanon as special. Lebanese went into a civil war because of external pressure and influence as well as internal uh, complicity, mm. okay? We had complicity internally and then there was a lot of external, uh, you know, powers that were playing out using Lebanon as a to wage proxy wars. Yes. Politically, a lot of people around the world understand that, but the image of Lebanon over the last four decades has significantly improved and and because he had that period of about 15 years, 18 years of redevelopment um, and growth, even up to 2020, uh, 2015, it seemed like the country was moving in the right direction. Mm. But unfortunately, it was moving in a direction on, uh, you know, like uh, it was they built the castle on sand, you know, and disease and corruption and it looked good. Um, from the outside, from the outside, yeah. but the there was the foundations were rotten. Mm. But to your question, the media pers uh, description of Lebanon shifted, not not you know not fully, fully yeah. but you know you had Lebanon in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten uh, declared the most or Beirut the best holiday destination in the world. Amazing. You know, um, and CNN did a poll in 2017 or something like that said, you know, um, it's the best night scene in the world, like a top three or top five night scenes in the world is Beirut, you know. It was coming back online, you yeah. know, but um, but look, we didn't look after yeah, our country. Look, we can talk about Lebanon for hours and hours, yeah. especially <laughs> me and you. Yeah. But do you think the Lebanese diaspora, have done enough or are they doing enough for this country? If it wasn't for the Lebanese diaspora, Lebanon would be a basket case, impoverished, worse than Congo, Sudan and any poverty-driven country, poverty-stricken country in the world. The Lebanese diaspora has been underwriting Lebanon. There's no country in the world, this was um, a report from the World Bank said, Lebanese um, what do they call them? Um, oh, I can't remember the financial term, but the um, the remittances, foreign remittances, money coming in from the diaspora to Lebanon is the highest in the world. It is 40% of the Lebanese GDP is from the diaspora sending money to their family. If this didn't happen, there was be, there would be no growth, no development, no basis in Lebanon. You wouldn't have 
and nobility, all of these donations. God bless the Lebanese diaspora. Yeah. We are think- so good at giving and rising, but we need to also, and see, this is the thing that I want to get involved in politics. I don't want to get involved in the dirty part of it. But, you know, there's a great Desmond Tutu quote. Um, he said, you know, um, it's important for us to, to pull people out of the river which means save them when they're drowning, when it's in times of crisis. But every now and then we need to turn our head upstream and find out who's throwing them back in. Those people throwing them back in are happy for us to keep pulling people out of the river because that means our money, we're throwing our money, diaspora, to save people. Right now we have a crisis, we're sending money, we're sending aid, and they are causing this because they want us to be distracted from the how to fix it. Who's they? The politicians. politicians. The, the You know, the oligarchs, you know, the main parties that have been controlling Lebanon for the last three decades, you know? No. So do, you, do you think the the local Lebanese appreciate what the Lebanese diaspora are doing for them now? I swear to you, I don't think there's one Lebanese and I, it's two and a half, three years there and being back and forth so many times when I was making my documentary. So from 2016, 2017, I was back and forth filming and then I've been living there. There is not one person that doesn't keep Bursal Israel diaspora. Mm. Everyone from the politicians to the pe- humble people. يعني كثر خير المغتربين يعني ونحن كنا متنا. This is what they say, mm. you know, like there is not I couldn't one word ever that has been a negative. But- don't you think they should get the act together and start doing build a real country instead of just counting on everyone else to come and build their country? And I'm with you. I'm with you. And it's really, it's like, you know, um, there's something that we went through this in the diaspora because um, I'm in, involved in a lot of global diaspora groups to try and come together. We had this problem. We had this question come up amongst us as diaspora. Because we as diaspora have a problem. We can't nijma sawa to had fard yani vision for Lebanon or one banner. And so we're trying to say to them, why can't you get together and fix your country? We have democracy, we have freedom, we have all of the luxury, we have peace. And we have all of the luxury, we have peace. كيف نحن عندنا حق؟ Do you want me to say it in English or Arabic? I, so I, I'm Arabic going in the... How do we have the right to say that to them? And this is something that really woke up a lot of diaspora groups. Like, if we want to tell them to get their shit together, basically, we need to get our shit together too. We need to understand what values do we stand for? What kind of Lebanon do we want as a diaspora? We've lived in democracies. We've seen how how important it is to have our rights and what this and follow rules and procedures. There are rules and procedures for a reason. So why can't we come together and create something and work together? I think we don't have a we yet. We do have a we. We do have a <laughs> we. We have a conflict about the we and how we define the we. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. That's right. Where do you start from? But we are we are making progress. And let me tell you, it's been a year and a half, nearly, nearly two years as a diaspora, global diaspora, and we're working on a project right now for Independence Day, which is wonderful. So we're seeing groups from what all over the world. Day? What independence? Lebanese independence. Ah, the, Lebanese, the official yeah. independence. 22nd November. But to, to create uh, an event for the 24th because it's Sunday, because 22nd is a Friday, people can't leave work and come so to something. So you guys believe that Lebanon is an independent country? Right so now, defend. right now we're defending we're Lebanon's defending sovereignty, sovereignty and we are standing up and saying our independence is at risk right yeah. now. We can lose our sovereignty because we have two countries that really um uh, trying to challenge our independence, one internally subtly, Iran, the other one overtly and crushing us, Israel. We're going to talk about Israel. Okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's enough of Lebanon. To be honest with you, we can talk about Lebanon for hours, as yeah. we said before. 
Okay, um, my last question to you. How was your experience with Brains Plot? And if you do re recommend Brains Plot for other guests? Well, I got to tell you, it's one of the most uh, engaging, challenging interviews I've had, and I loved it. Um, you're a very intelligent um, interviewer. I really like your Thank style, you. and I've been interviewed a lot, and I'm an interviewer, and so I really respect your questions. Well thought out, and um, you know you come with a re with a mission, and that's you come with a plan. So I've had a great experience. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope people uh, have you know benefited from the information that we've given them. I totally recommend it for people to watch this podcast and every podcast of yours, Roland, because you are not doing it without, you know, a lot of people just sit and talk, but you come studied, like you've come well-researched, and I respect that. Thank you, Roland.